Good morning, everyone. How are you feeling? <laughs> yeah. Woo! This sweatshirt is made out of 20 Daydream views. No, I'm kidding. It's, I just bought it. <laughs> All right. Let's get started. <laughs> My name is Brahim Bouchikhi, and I'm a product manager on the platform team, on the Daydream platform team. We have two goals for this talk. The first is to share a bunch of data and insights we've learned from being in market for the last six months. We think it's important that as the VR industry gets started, that we share as much as we can with the broader community. The second goal is to walk you through how we're taking those insights and that data and applying it to the Daydream platform itself to make it work better for developers and for users. So let's get started. First is a bunch of updates. These are recaps you've heard probably already. First, we now have eight Daydream-ready phones. If you recall, last year in November, we launched with support for the Pixel and the Pixel XL. But our mission has always been about bringing high-quality mobile VR to everyone. So we've been hard at work to bring in more devices that support Daydream. We're also particularly excited about the fact that the Samsung S8 will also be Daydream ready in the coming weeks. Also, LG's flagship device that is available later this summer will also be Daydream ready. And finally, our existing partners, Asus and Motorola, will also be bringing more Daydream ready devices to market. So putting all that together, as Mike summarized in the morning, we'll have tens of millions of Daydream ready devices in market. Those devices, when paired with one of the headsets, create, allow you to experience Daydream. So that's a great user base for you all to target with your content. The other big news, obviously, of I.O. is the introduction of the standalone VR headset. Darren is going to get on stage in a bit and tell you a lot more about the headsets and how they work and, and other things. But the one thing I want to highlight is that they, the, 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 the standalone headsets get at the same mission of the smartphones, which is bringing high-quality mobile VR to everyone. In this case, if you don't own an Android device, this may be an option. Another option is maybe a different user journey where you have a shared device that's available at home that's always connected to power and also to, to Wi-Fi. And that way, you can jump into VR anytime. So then we get into more details, but we're super excited about this development, obviously. Finally, at the end of the day, users purchase these headsets to experience the content that developers create. And we're excited that since January, we're more than tripled the number of apps available on Daydream to 150. It's exciting, and we expect to see an increase in momentum over the coming months as we roll out more of the experiences that are being developed at the moment. So that's great news. All right. So we'll share five insights with you. These are data-driven insights that we hope you'll find useful as you create your VR content. First, this is Daydream Home in its current form. Again, Dan will get on stage and tell you about how we will be change in the future. But in the current form, we have those three panels at the top. We call them discovery windows. These panels are used to feature specific content. These are deep links to videos, to apps, and specific experiences in an app. We use them to feature content for users. So keep that in mind as I share the data next. First, 25% of sessions on Daydream begin with no specific intent. And if you think about that, if you think about your smartphone, how often do you turn on your smartphone with absolutely no intent? Not to check time, not to check email, not to check Twitter, not to play a game, not to do other things. And so in smartphones, we become very task-centric. There's a specific thing you're trying to do with the phone, and you're going to go there to do that. This is quite different. Lots of users are coming with no intent. The next data point is that 40% of all sessions include at least one click on a discovery window, which benchmarking against traditional merchandising type experiences is actually quite good. Finally, 35% of all sessions include a visit to Play Store VR. If you put these three data points together, our takeaway is that on VR and VR, users are in discovery mode. They're open-minded. They're coming and saying, what's awesome in VR? What can I do today? What can I experience today in Daydream? 
And that's great news because it creates an opportunity for developers to fill that need, to create great content that people love and use and purchase, which is obviously essential. You know, I was on Android Market in 2011, and at the time, high-quality apps got a lot of traffic, a lot of users, a lot of attention. And we see it in a similar state at this point in VR. And so the insight we're trying to share with you today is as a, as a developer, this may be the time to get involved, start experimenting, start iterating, so they can build the Angry Birds or VR. Angry Birds standing in for the breakout hit. So if you remember in 2009, when Angry Birds came out, it's one of the first titles where everything came together just perfectly. The game mechanic used the screen in a unique way. The characters were really great. The branding, the monetization model worked. Everything worked really well, but that wasn't an overnight success. It took a lot of iteration. It took a lot of work to actually get there. And so we firmly believe that developers on Daydream today are converging on that breakout hit, learning, iterating, and getting closer to creating this breakout hit. So if you've been, as a developer, thinking about VR, considering whether to get involved or not, I'd urge you to look closer and consider actually doing that. So next, I'm going to show you a video from a title that just became available on Daydream called Lola and the Giant. It's built by Climax Studios. And what's awesome about this title is, one, the environment is super awesome. It's really immersive. It's great. And there are two characters. There's a giant who you actually can take the perspective of the giant in the game, and you can have different skill sets, and, and it's literally like a giant. And then you can also be a third-person follower along with Lola as she conquers all sorts of challenges and does all sorts of fun stuff. Interestingly, also, there is a companion experience where outside of VR, there you go, the video is playing, where outside of VR, a user can also interact in the game. And so you can have this asymmetric game experience where one person is in 2D, the other is in VR, and they're able to collaborate together. We think that's really fun. And we think this is a title that's getting at that breakout hit. We feel it's a title that's getting at create, trying different things, innovating in the space, and really getting at something awesome. So if you haven't tried it, it just came out. It's super awesome. Please do. Now, let's talk about monetization. That's obviously a big part of this, a big part of making you, uh, helping you earn a living on Daydream. And so a couple of data points I want to share with you is that on Daydream, we've seen three times as many buyers as you would on traditional mobile on Google Play. And those buyers are spending 32% more than they would on traditional mobile. This is good news, right? Because creating VR content is expensive. It's hard. It takes a lot of time. And the fact that users are responding well, they're willing to purchase the content, and also they're actually spending more on it, that's really good news for our developer community and for our platform. However, we talk to our users a lot. We do a lot of user studies. We talk to them a lot. And in almost every single one, We've heard feedback that if we had a way, if users had a way to try an experience before buying it, that would help them make that purchase decision more frequently. And so the insight here is actually more of an ask, most of a request. If you have an experience on Daydream today, if it is premium, i.e., like you got to pay up front, look at ways, consider ways to actually introduce a trial to it. It is not easy. There is no single way to do this, right? It depends by title, it depends by user, it depends by developing your goals for your title. So it's not easy, but we believe that this isn't something that's going to go away. The need for trying an experience is fundamental to VR because it's an immersive technology. I got to be in it to actually know what it's about. There are also physiological differences that make it so one title that's comfortable for one user may not be as comfortable for someone else. So the need just makes sense. We're doing our best to figure this out, and as soon as we do, we'll, as usual, communicate our findings. But as developers, iterating and experimenting in this direction 
how do you get your users to experiment and try your content first is actually going to be key to, again, get into that successful monetization, successful breakout hit. Now let's talk about usage patterns. What we've seen on Daydream is that users are spending, on average, about 40 minutes a week in VR. What's unique is that this is spent in a couple of sessions only in the evenings at home or on the weekends. And if today you are a developer of a 2D game or app, it's quite different from what you're seeing, right? What you're seeing today is a lot of interactions, a lot of micro sessions of 30 seconds to a minute to a couple of minutes maybe, where you are getting users coming back. They are either collecting energy or points or something and then going back out again. That's different in VR. And so the, the, the way we've been kind of summarizing this now for a while is that as you build content for VR, think of a sit-down meal experience, not a snack. It's not something that people are doing throughout the day. It's fewer, longer sessions. Next, I want to show you a video from the Gorillaz' uh, latest album. This was created in collaboration with Google Spotlight Stories. And what's awesome about this, you're actually in a train track. It's moving super fast. You feel literally like you're there. And you can look around. There are different characters. There are gorillas behind you. And you're actually listening to the music. And there's also a tablet showing you what would probably look like a traditional music video. And what's awesome about this medium of VR video is that not only are you listening to the artist's creation as a song, you're also experiencing the environment they wanted you to be in when you listen to it. And it just works really well. If you haven't tried this, it's actually got 3 million views in 48 hours, making it the biggest debut of a VR video on YouTube ever. It was super awesome. Give it a try if you haven't yet. And so the takeaway here, and the, and the fact actually, is that nearly 50% of all time in Daydream is spent in video experiences. This is split across flat content, this is traditional 2D content that's projected in a personal cinema, as we like to call it, uh, from Netflix, Hulu, Play Movies, HBO, and also immersive 360 VR video that's created by our partners, our Baobao, and WeVR, and NextVR, and Within, and many others who have created truly awesome uh, videos. A lot of them are documentaries that allows you to really be immersed in the story and feel, uh, probably, to be honest, as uh, as much about how that person, that documentary feel as ever before in media. So the insight here is that video is really a core use case of mobile VR. It is a core use case. And so as a developer, as a creator, think about ways to use it to augment your experience, to create an experience that's great. So for example, as we talked about trials, maybe VR video is a way to offer that trial. And finally, I want to share another data point with you about quality. This chart shows a correlation between time in an app and the app's rating. Of course, it's a positive correlation. The significance is actually quite high. But what's important here is we purposely chose time in app, not installs, which is how you traditionally look at app ratings. And you say, if I have a higher rating, I get more installs, and that's great. But here, we wanted to show engagement and use and the impact of having a great quality app. Now, keep in mind that Daydream has a fairly stringent quality review process. So these apps aren't like crashing or have low frames per second or other things. The difference here is actually almost thinking from good to great, not so much kind of very poor. And the difference is being the immersiveness of the content, the depth of the content, the environment and the beauty of it. And so as you build content for VR, think about quality, but not only in terms of technical quality, also in the depth of the experience and just how awesome it is. So to summarize, now is the time for you as a developer to jump in and potentially create VR's Angry Birds. It will take time, and those developers creating today are iterating and approaching that milestone. Trials are fundamental parts of VR content creation. 
and they will help unlock the full potential of monetization. So you need to think about those from day one. In terms of content duration and length, think about a sit-down meal experience. Think about how you could use video to augment your experience. And finally, quality in VR goes beyond the technical aspects and into depth of the content and just how immersive the experience is. So that's all. I'm going to turn it over to Darren now, who will show you how we're taking these insights and more and improving the daydream experience for you and for our users. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Brahim. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Darren DeLay, and I lead the user experience design team for the Daydream platform. And today I get to tell you more about some of the design work my team has been doing, how we think about designing the experience for our standalone VR headsets, and some of the improvements that we're making uh, for Daydream Platform 2.0 Euphrates, which is the release later this year. This week, we've announced Daydream standalone headsets with WorldSense positional tracking, an all new form factor for VR. And I'm going to break this down into some pieces. First, let's talk about what it means to have a standalone headset. A standalone headset, custom made, you know, purpose built for VR, brings a new level of convenience to how you access VR. When it's on your counter or your coffee table, and you can pick it up and in just a few seconds be in VR, I think you'll find that you and the other members of your household will end up going into VR a lot more often. Lowering the friction to go into VR makes a big difference. From a developer perspective, you use the same exact developer tools and SDKs for, as you do for smartphone VR. And in most cases, you'll create apps that run on both smartphone VR and standalone VR headsets. Existing Daydream apps like these are all compatible with the standalone headsets. And for interacting with VR apps, you'll still be using the Daydream motion controller to point and swing and play. Now, since there isn't a phone mode, setup and settings are all done from inside the headset. These will be some of the very first VR systems where there isn't a phone or a PC as the primary setup device. And what I want to mention here is that uh, the same goes for app developers. There are some great examples of what we call hybrid 2D and 3D apps for Daydream. For example, the app named Within has a great phone mode where you can look at a preview of all the videos they've released. And if you want to check one out, click on it and hop into VR. So just keep in mind that uh, since your standalone headset users will only have VR, you need to make sure that important required features like account sign-in or settings are accessible from your game engine VR mode. All right, now let's talk about WorldSense positional tracking. We get full six degrees of freedom tracking, or six off tracking. Uh, that works with no external wires, sensors, or setup. It just works. It's based on technology from the Tango team that tracks objects in real time as they move about in 3D space. So instead of just being able to know the orientation of the headset, where you're looking, uh, now we're going to be able to track the movement of your head as well in any direction. Now, these WorldSense headsets are optimized for seated and standing virtual reality. It allows you to naturally move, lean, shift your weight and body position however you want. Positional tracking creates a much more immersive VR experience. Everything feels more real. And in turn, that makes the experience more comfortable. The realism comes in large part from your natural perception of all the tiny movements that your head is making all the time that create parallax between foreground and background elements. The same thing happens in the real world when you perceive the world all day, every day. Here's a quick example of a dodgeball game demo. You can duck and dodge out of the way. I lean out of the way every time I watch this video. <laughs> Sorry. If you want to create an experience that requires ducking and dodging and leaning, you can. You can target our WorldSense headsets.
And we do want to make sure that people stay safe in their physical space. Most people don't have a lot of space. And even if you clear an area in your room, we want to help people avoid bumping into their furniture and their walls. We have a basic safety system in place that encourages people to stay roughly in one spot and not walk around, not wander too far from the, where they set as the center of their experience. Remember, this is mobile VR, so you can start your experience anywhere in the room, or really anywhere. And we have a sensor that actually detects when you put the headset on and where you are, which lets us set that as the default starting position with the VR world centered around you. Uh, now I'm going to give you a couple of quick things to think about if you're creating apps and games uh, for our Daydream WorldSense headsets. Here's one thing that works really well. The scenes with relatively small items that are pretty close up when you move back and forth from side to side. Although you don't want anything closer than about half a meter from your face for too long. If you think about something like a board game on a table, or a game where you feel really big because all the characters are really small, those are going to feel really good when you shift your weight and get a large amount of parallax from small movements. For example, you'll be able to see one, around one character to see the character behind. In this example from the game Mikarama, uh, there's a user peeking from side to side to plan out how they're going to solve the puzzle. But here's an example where you may have to design around the parallax. In this pointer-based interface, something that we use frequently in Daydream, when the user hovers their cursor over an item, we usually bring it towards them a bit. And it looks like this. You're highlighting the item in the upper left. So here's what it might look like if this UI is pretty close up to the user and they've moved or leaned over to the right. It's not pointing at them anymore. They're kind of looking at it from a side angle. And you might decide that this isn't what you want. There are lots of ways to design around this. You might decide that you want to turn the UI. But one that I want to mention quickly is you can make everything look roughly the same and move the UI farther back from the user. And you'll have to scale up the cards and the text to compensate to make it still legible. And if you move the UI farther away, then when the user makes that same amount of movement over to the right, they're going to see a smaller amount of parallax, and it's going to look more similar to how it does from straight on. So if you want to learn more about how my team specifies designs like this, how we create legible and usable UIs, we have a great talk tomorrow about designing screen interfaces for VR that I think you should check out. Now, if you want your users to be able to move over greater distances in VR, our favorite method is to have people teleport from spot to spot. And this is a pattern that a lot of apps have adopted already. This is what we've found uh, most effective in all types of VR, from smartphone VR to positionally tracked systems. In fact, we've noticed that once you give people the ability to teleport, they actually stop their urge to walk around and just teleport all around. And they start intuitively using it, and they end up staying safer and not needing as big of a physical space. So we're big fans of teleporting around in VR. And we're releasing a new set of sample code as something that we call Daydream Elements, which, is, uh, which has an implementation of teleporting that you can get used to get you started. This recording is from the Daydream Elements sample app. OK. Now we're going to switch over and talk about features in the Daydream 2.0 Euphrates release that's coming out later this year. These are features coming to all headsets, both smartphone VR and standalone VR. Here's a preview of our updated Daydream Home. We've had users tell us that Daydream Home is simple and approachable, and we plan to keep it that way. We'll swipe through these. OK. So the changes we've made are mostly related to the discovery windows that you see in the middle. Now there are more of them, and they're organized into collections. Some collections are for new users with the all-time best content that nobody should miss. Other collections are for people who are watching this space frequently for newly released content and, for new, and new releases. 
And other collections are on a trend or a theme that people are gravitating to when they come to Daydream. All these discovery windows feature all kinds of content, apps and games, as well as individual experiences and videos. They're actually under the hood Android intents that we deep link to. So if you're creating an app that has individual experiences, make sure to plan for those incoming links. Our goal with Daydream Home is that people will come to VR frequently and they'll never run out of new things to experience. The next feature is what we call the system dashboard. The motivation for this is that sometimes you're in the middle of a VR experience and you wonder if there's something that needs your attention or you just need to check the time. We want to enable these things without a jarring interruption to your experience. So when the user presses the system button, the system dashboard will pop up. And when they press the system button again, it'll disappear and return them right back into what they're doing. Users can check on status like time and battery life. They can activate system features like do not disturb mode or casting, which I'll talk more about in a moment. Or they can quickly launch the next app they want to open. They can also check their notifications, which can give them peace of mind about whether they have more time to stay in VR. OK. In Daydream 1.0, there were a couple of scenarios when you may have had to take your phone out of the headset and complete a task in phone mode before you could continue. That would be like if YouTube, in this example, needed to access uh, permission, needed to have access to the microphone and needed to ask for permission so that they could do it. you could do a voice search. Or if you needed to update your credit card expiration date to make a purchase of a game. Well, we're bringing those experiences into VR so that you can complete these required tasks quickly and get back to what you want to do. If you think about it, this was something that we had to do for our standalone headsets, and it's a nice improvement for smartphone VR as well. Stepping back, I think that one of our most important roles here at Daydream is to try to make sure that VR fits into your life, not just something that you do by yourself. And so my favorite feature that we're announcing today is casting. I bet many of you here have given VR demos to your friends, and it's great to see their reactions to new VR experiences. But it's not so great if they get a little bit stuck, or they ask you what to click on, but you can't see what's happening. Or sometimes there will be one person in VR and other people just waiting their turn. So with casting, we can bridge the gap. You can share the experience with the whole group. And here's our animation of how it works. In the system dashboard, you choose the cast receiver, and it starts playing on your TV right away. Uh, and they work, these casts work across apps. So you can start a session and pass the headset to multiple people, uh, check out multiple apps with the cast running the whole time. We think this is going to make mobile VR that much more fun in your living room. OK. For developers, if you want to get a little fancy, there are some interesting gameplay mechanics that you could consider implementing using casting. In this example, prototypers from our Daydream Labs team have created essentially acting out a puppet show where the person in the headset is giving a tour of the spaceship. And the people uh, watching on the TV have a fixed camera position. You have to have enough performance overhead available for your app to be able to render this extra camera. So it's a little bit challenging. But there are really interesting things. Like, for example, you could be playing a guessing game, a party game, where there's something that the person in the headset is supposed to know, but not the people in the room. Or the opposite, that there's something that the people in the room should see that the person in the headset shouldn't. OK, and for times where you're not in the same room as your friends, we're also announcing support for VR captures both screenshots and video recordings, which will save to your device, and you can sync with Google Photos and share them however you want. You know, we use our smartphone cameras in the real world every day, and this is the start of being able to record and share the best things that you encounter in VR as well. So find out more at developers.google.com slash VR, which we've uh, added one of my favorite new tools for Daydream developers, which is Instant Preview which makes iterating in Unity and Unreal much faster by letting you play a live preview directly onto your Daydream view. 
And here are the upcoming Daydream talks that I encourage you to attend, three more today and one tomorrow from our design team. So thank you very much.